is a pretty important lecture today in terms of your importance of career and of safety, right? So how many of you have heard the term hazard? Yeah. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of or hear the word hazard? What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the term hazard? For those of you that are, know the term. Well, I'm you to use it between our health and safety team going to evaluate a site to make sure that it's safe for our people. Yeah. Okay, so the health and safety team is an evaluation. Anything else? Any, like, what's your gut reaction? Any terms that come to mind? Any feelings? What do you feel about hazard? Do you like it? Do you don't like it? What is what are some other things about hazard that you know? Great. Uh, generally, they take like a long time to do. So you go and make sure you get every look at every unit and make sure you in and out. Um, and figure out like, what can go wrong. Okay. And where I worked, it was uh, you take a week to do a unit. Okay. Or, or a plant. Yeah. One week for a unit or for the whole? Well, well, for one section. Okay. How many hours a day? Eight hours. Eight hours. Okay. Anything else about hazard that people have experienced before? Yeah. Can you turn in the cell number to get the safety rating for resting and putting an interlock? So you do the calculation to get the cell number. And then you, uh, order a safety based on that rating. Okay, so a SIL number is a rating that's internal to your company that yeah. low number is low risk, high number is high risk. Yeah. Okay. Safety is really low. Okay, so you, so you, you develop ratings. Okay, so you in your company you do that as part of your handbook. Yeah. Okay, other companies will call it a different meeting. We'll call a different meeting for that. Okay, and you that. Anything else about this that people know? David, you say that you've heard of hazard? I haven't heard it, and we would have stood more that same. Okay. Anyone experienced the hazard, being involved in one? No. Okay, so let's take a quick uh, look at what hazard and operability studies are in today's class and tomorrow's class. We'll lead into hazard, though, by looking at those first two points uh, checklists and relative rankings. Now, there was already some. When we mentioned the term hazard, just looking at a few people's faces, this, this often comes up, right? And engineers particularly have this attitude. Uh, it's all these stupid tables, it's long meetings, I hate them. Why don't we just go ahead and do the engineering? And that's, that's what we feel, right? I've been involved in several hazards as well. It's a huge time drain. Like, this is not uncommon to do, spend a whole week with your time blocked off to just analyze one flow sheet. Right, so that's very typical. So, and then in the meantime, your boss is expecting other work to be done. So engineers, understandably, and I, I get this, I've experienced this, we hate it. Right? We, don't, we absolutely hate hazards because we have this attitude that it's, it's not paying off in any way. You're not, you've got nothing to show for it at the end. right? At the end, you've got a nice Excel spreadsheet or some, some document in a piece of software and you've not done too much, or you feel like you've not done too much. But consider the opposite case, right? If you take this flow sheet here, so we've looked at this now in the past few days. So this is a tall distillation tower, um, the, the deep coconizer and the deep unionizer over there, and there's the condensers and reboilers. Now, close your eyes or don't close your eyes, but imagine yourself standing next to that deep unionizer and that condenser. So this is a tall building. It's like the one we saw in the video for BP Texas City. And think of the number of engineers that were involved in designing this process. Would you want them to have done the HAZOP properly and have spent at least a week of their time doing that HAZOP? Okay, so we know that if I'm walking onto a site, I've never been to a site. Like, I often visit companies and I walk onto their facilities, hard down shoes, all the safety gear. I have no idea what's gone on on the 30, 40 years, or maybe five years, whatever, prior to me walking onto that facility. 
right? So what's all the engineering, what's all the safety? I have no idea, but I'm hoping that it's been done well. And us in our careers will be involved in these hazard and operability studies so that future engineers, other employees, people coming onto the facility, the neighbors around the facility are safe. So absolutely, I agree with the sentiment. Um, why don't we just go ahead and do the engineering? But on the other hand, we have to recognize what, why we're doing this. So this is Dr. Marlin's take on this. Um, but it's the same, the same thing I just mentioned. Like you walk into a facility, you really hope that that, that safety analysis has been done properly. So it's a bit intimidating, right? For your course projects as well, you're developing diagrams that are starting to slowly build up from the basic units and you're adding control loops and you're adding your safety and your alarm systems and so forth. And you're going to end up with something that maybe looks like this or a little less complex or so on. The hazard and operability study starts from this point. So one of the first things we do when we start a hazard is to get this diagram. And the problem is, it's so overwhelming. Where do you even begin to do an analysis of the safety of this process? How would you go about it? Any suggestions? So what? No suggestions? Um, I just have a question. Is a HAZOP different than a FEMA, or would you use FEMAs in your HAZOP? So, okay, so a FEMA, a failure mode and effects analysis is one acronym that often comes up in association with HAZOPs. Some companies will do them integrated, some companies will do them separately, some companies conceptually consider them the same thing. Um, so, it's, there's no correct answer. For this, would you start at your FEMA in, so at V29? Okay, so I'm here at B29 and, and then work your way like follow up first. Okay, so the general approach is exactly that. You start at your feed point, so here's my feed coming in, and you consider that pipe and this drum, and then next you consider this pipe, those valves, then you consider that pump, and you consider this pipe after that, and you consider that splitter. So for every one of these, you propagate yourself through the flow sheet, and you take very narrowly defined units. So that's going to be surprising for you at first. You'll do a hazard and operability study on that pipe. Then you'll do a hazard and operability study on that tank over there. And then you'll do it on this, this portion of the pipe leaving the tank, feeding out to the pump. Then you'll do a hazard on the pump itself. Okay. So it's very detailed and this is why engineers hate it. And this is why you see this for very small flow sheet. You can have a whole week of your time allocated to doing the hazard and operability study. Now I will also mention, if you ever get the chance and a hazard and operability study is something that you're volunteered to do or you can get yourself involved, like you're not forced to do it. So if you have the option of doing it, I would highly recommend you actually do it. Because this is the one point in your career where if you're involved in that study for that period of time, you will come out at the end of that process actually knowing what that process is doing. Prior to that, it's just a flow sheet and a diagram. But after you've gone through that study, you will know exactly what that process is doing in very, very thorough detail, okay? Because it's this very intensive consideration of the, of the flow sheet, and it's done by a group of people. It's never a single person. So we'll talk about that coming up in a minute. So let's... Uh, take a look at some terminology that's used when we look at hazard and operability studies. The first is, of course, what's a hazard? Okay. What do you consider a hazard right now? In a chemical process, what might be a hazard? Anything that endangers or puts, puts people or workers in right. Like a specific example? <clears throat> What is hazardous about the processes we work with? High pressure. High pressures. <laughs> there, yeah. High temperatures. Dangerous chemicals. Toxicity, dangerous chemicals, carcinogens, poisons, toxins. Okay, those are hazards. By themselves, they're not doing anything. High temperature is not going to kill you. High pressure is not going to kill you on its own. 
it's when it goes from being a hazard to an accident, that's when the damage occurs. But on its own, a hazard is simply just the potential for an accident to occur. So high temperature has the potential for it, but it's not going to do it. Okay? We, we work with these materials all day long at high temperature and pressure without incident. So that's just a hazard. The risk then is the probability of that hazard causing an accident. So that's something we're comfortable with already from our daily lives. An incident then is when this hazard can propagate and a set of circumstances arise. So an undesired circumstance. So this is an action by someone. Okay, this would be like an operator opening a valve that shouldn't be open and there's high temperature on the other side. So that circumstance by the operators opening the valve that will then produce the potential for the accident. So high temperature on the other side of the valve, someone opens that valve, and an accident may or may not occur. An incident will produce this. An accident is where that actually goes and causes damage to the environment, damage to the person, um, or property. Okay, so there's a bit of this it seems very great, some of the overlap there, but it's a terminology that's commonly used in the operability studies. And we've seen that earlier that uh, in the video that accidents really are, we could call near misses, should be called accidents. These are just events that we were just lucky that they didn't go and cause um, death or an injury or um, we didn't go, there's no toxins or carcinogens released to the environment. Uh, so near misses are very, very close accidents and really should be considered as accidents in many of these. Yeah. If near misses are considered as accidents, then what are incidents? Okay, so incidents, okay, is an undesired circumstance so due to the potential for the accidents. Okay, so it's, yeah, I guess you could call near miss an incident as well. So I, this terminology is very nebulous. What you'll see is um, like when I was working in Glaxo, they were very specific on what they're going to consider uh, to be each one. And other companies will have, have their, their definitions. So it, it, as long as you're in a consistent framework, it's not, not, a, not a catastrophic thing. So let's take a look here then. When we do hazard and operability studies, the first thing is to recognize that we've got a wealth of experience going ahead of us. So we've got 100 years of chemical operation in many industries. Other industries are a little younger, but we can really learn from previous studies. So many case studies and textbooks have been written, and from those, people have gone and compiled lists. So these are very simple lists that say, if you're dealing with a heat exchanger, here's the top 20 incidents that have occurred over the past 100 years. And you just go through it and check, check, check that you've engineered your process not to have those features or you've created control loops and safety systems to avoid those problems. So for example, BP Texas City, the level controller at the bottom, malfunctioning, and then that column <coughs> filling up to the top, overflowing into the vapor stream. That had happened over, over 100 times in the prior decade and had been the cause of many incidents and near misses. Okay, so it hadn't led to death and injury, but vapor filling up uh, sorry, the liquid filling up in going into the vapor line is such a common, common problem in distillation columns. And it's a simple thing added to a checklist. It's, in fact, it's the most common problem in distillation column startup. So there is a case where a simple checklist that implements a system to avoid liquid going beyond a certain level because this is known to have caused problems prior would have saved that incident. So checklists are really a way that say we recognize, we obviously recognize, we cannot go and study every case study in our industry. But there's no way we can have that time. So let's go take and summarize that data in a list and look at it targeted for specific material. There's lists for certain equipment. There's lists for certain operating procedures, so cleaning, startup, shutdown. There's many checklists available. There's many on the internet. Many are free as well. So AICHE and the British equivalents, they publish many of these checklists. So they're, they're, they're not hard to get hold of. Now, of course, they will never be able to cover a new process or new equipment or new technology. And also bear in mind that incidents that can occur at very low frequency. So 
things that occur maybe once every decade or once every 20 years, those are not going to be recorded in the checklist. These are very unusual incidents. But there's a whole trade-off between frequency versus consequence. Right? If, the, if the frequency is very low, the consequence is high, we must consider that. So nuclear reactor disasters, frequency is very low, consequences are generally high for nuclear failure. So those, um, that gives you an idea of what I'm, I'm pointing out here, is that this sort of feature is not going to show up in a checklist. Checklists generally are like the top 20, top 50 events that occur in the process. Another one that we can use to help us um, along, before we even get to the hands-on, is what's called relative ranking. So relative ranking is a way that we look at a flow sheet, especially a flow sheet that's not fully designed yet. So think of your case study for your project. We haven't got a fully defined process yet, so we don't need the details of the process. That's important here. No details are required, so the technology of the process isn't required, but it helps us to do an evaluation. And especially where this is used is to compare two technology, uh, sorry, two, two options for a flow sheet. So is one option versus another option more safe or less safe? Okay, so companies will often use this. If you, uh, there was, for example, I mentioned the Mopel uh, case study. Union Carbide had chosen a flow sheet that had a reactive intermediate that was toxic. Okay, their competitor Bayer in Germany had an alternative technology that went without creating that active intermediate needing to be stored and causing the potential for risk, right? So their selection there, well, you can see if you had the choice to select between these two technologies, how this ranking might assist you. So we'll take a look at, at, it, at it in a minute. We'll actually apply it. But uh, then once you've completed your ranking, you get a score, a single number, and then you can see how you rate. So this is a, a, an index developed by Dow Chemical, and they've made it openly available to all engineers. So you can go look it up as well in, in the library or from ANCHE's website. OK, so it's also used by insurance companies. If when your, your insurance agent comes into your company, you have to let them in to write up your insurance policy. They will probably be using something very similar to this to decide on what your insurance premiums are. Um, it gets us a quick estimate. And the nice thing is that if you've got two or three engineers each doing this, they should get roughly the same answer. Whereas with a hazard and operability study, it's kind of interesting. Every engineer will have a different study performed, right? Because each person has their own take on things. But with this relative ranking, we should get similar answers for, um, for the same process. So let's take a look at this example. This is out in Stony Creek. Bartek makes malaic hydride. It's a food ingredient that's added to bread and pastries and candy to create an acidic taste in your mouth. And they create it from butane. Okay, so they take butane liquid butane vaporize it, combine it with their reactant, and then they form the lake and hydride and these several separation steps after that. Okay. So let's take a look at their flow sheets. Liquid butane is delivered by rail car and stored <coughs> at the site in this facility under pressure. So what's the boiling point of butane? Going from liquid to vapor at atmospheric pressure. Roughly, it's a hydrocarbon. Order of magnitude number, anyone? Butane, come on. Yeah. Cigarette lighter gas. Okay, who smokes cigarette lighters? Nope. Okay, <laughs> so it's liquid under very moderate pressure. At about zero degrees Celsius, it goes to vapor. Okay, so liquid butane is stored in there under slight pressure um, and is then pumped into a valve, uh, sorry, through this pump, into, through the valve, into this unit over here. What's that unit doing? to vaporize it. So we've got a, a vapor stream of butane now under pressure over here. Coming in. 
we've got something joining us. So let's take a look. We've got air here, compressor. This compressor is about the size of the front of this classroom where I am standing. It's a big guy, and it's sucking in a huge quantity of atmospheric air, compressing it up to a high pressure. So that comes in over here. Now you've got butane and air. That's the first thing that comes to mind. <clears throat> what is butane? A cigarette lighter. Right? So you've got a cigarette lighter, you've got butane, you've got oxygen compressed in your air stream. <coughs> okay, so there's a risk right here. There's a flammable risk. But we can look up what the ratio is between butane and oxygen. There's certain ranges where we can have mixtures of butane and oxygen that are not flammable. Right? It's not every mixture of butane and oxygen is going to cause a flame. So this ratio between butane and oxygen is critical to control it so that it's not in that range where you're going to create an ignition and, and, um, and cause the flame inside your, your tubing here and then going into your reactor. So that's what this guy is all about, A1. A1 is a composition analyzer, measuring that composition of butane to make sure it's just right so they're not entering an unsafe point of operation. That's going into the reactor, this pipe is packed in here, a standard pack bed tubular reactor that then creates that reaction to the lake. Okay, so we're considering the part in purple. And the relative ranking approach works as follows. It's a little bit hard to see up here. It's far more detailed in the PDF on the course website that's posted. Okay. So the same PDF you were looking up the symbols for the tutorial on Monday. If you read a little bit further, there's this table in there in a lot more detail. So what we do is the Dow process simply says, what are you processing? What's your material? So here it's predominantly butane, and there's each material has a risk factor <coughs> or material factor. We write that down, we look it up, MF is 21. We're going to use it down here at the bottom. Then we say, okay, so what is the process hazards? Is there an exothermic reaction? Okay, there's no reaction here. We're simply heating butane from liquid to vapor, combining it with air. There's no intended reaction. So we're not, this process is not for, not for a reaction. So that's zero. It's not endothermic. Are we handling material? No, we're not. This is an enclosed unit, access drainage. All of those are zeros here for this particular case. We're dealing, then we're going to then add extra risk factors for special process hazards. Are we dealing with the toxic material? Okay, so we look up, this is not something we have to guess, we look this up from tables. So for short exposure under fire conditions, there's no toxic hazard for butane. I mean, you inhale it through a cigarette when you're lighting it up. So it's not toxic. Um, zero over here, no tank farms, no upsets. Always in the flammable range. Okay. We can look this up as well from tables. It's a 0.8. Just after we mix the butane and air, that gives us a, 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 a number from the tables of 0.8. There's no dust involved. There's pressure. So if there's pressure involved, again, we go look up a certain figure in the Dow tables, and we get a factor of 0.25. Um, so you can see how this is very easy to do. Right? Every engineer should be able to follow this process and get the same result at the end, as long as you can read tables and graphs. Uh, we can then look up this value of flammable material in, that's being processed. So there's a 0.1 rate rating over there. There's no solids, corrosion. Uh, we don't have information on corrosion necessarily, but um, we know from prior experience that this is not likely to cause corrosion. There's potential leakage from a pump. So again, that we look up. Fire heaters, there's none of those involved. There's rotating equipment, that big compressor over there, 0.5. And then we add all of these up. So add all of these guys up, that's F1. Add all of these up, that's F2. F3 then is the product of F1 and F2. So that's a number of 2.75. Take 2.75, multiply by that material factor, 21 up there, we get a value of 57.8. So on this ranking, it would be like this. So it's, that's, that's the general approach to take. Right? Now you could see, let's say there was an alternative to vaporized butane from liquid to vapor. 
and mixing it with oxygen and compressed air. There may be an alternative way of doing that. As long as we simply go look at that technology and say, are there these reactions occurring? Tank farms, dust, pressure, what's the pressure levels, so on, corrosion, leakage, fire heaters involved, and so forth. So it's very easy to follow this when you're comparing alternatives, and then you can pick a technology that has lower risk. So that's a, a straightforward step that's also done by some, by some companies. And so Dow Chemical uses that a lot because they're building many chemical processes all the time, so they've developed a systematic procedure for that. Let's take a look now next at the hazard and operability. This is where things start to differ. So if, if one person here in the room does it and I do the hazard and operability study and someone else over there does it, we're going to get three different answers. So that's one reason why hazard and operability studies are always done as a group. Let's take a look at how this is done. Uh, it's a formal process, so we'll introduce <coughs> the procedure now. Um, it's time consuming, we've mentioned that here already. By the way, this eight hours a week is actually really excessive. <coughs> the advice is that you shouldn't be doing more than four hours a day as an engineer. Four hours a day, stop your hazard and operability study, do something else, then come back the next day and do it. So that's, that's some guidance that's been given out. Um, but many companies will say, well, we can't do that, right? This is going to double the time, so we're just going to plow through this and spend eight hours and do it. Um, in one go, but there's a bit of a, a risk there that you overlook some things. So, what we're going to see here is that, as we're going to see on the next slide, it's in the examples, is that you need some considerable engineering insights. And this is why I said it's really good for you to be involved in one, because you're going to bring in your knowledge of reactor design, heat transfer, fluid flow, control systems, and the material you've learned here in 4A. Um, it's going to be necessary to solve these, these studies. Okay, so who's on a hazard and operability team? Who would you bring into the company, into that meeting room? It's a big group of people. Who's, who's all going to be there? Who do you think should be there? If you've never done one before. There's yourself, okay. Maybe the lead engineer, project uh, manager. Lead engineer, project manager. Maybe a senior engineer. Okay, so you've got three engineers in there now, plus yourself, that's four. And like a facilitator. A facilitator, okay. Kevin? You'd have someone from the uh, Joint Health and Safety Committee. Someone from the Health and Safety Committee. An environment guy. <laughs> okay. An operator. An operator? Yep. Anyone else? Who else should be invited to this fun time? Everybody. Okay, so operators are very important. If the process hasn't been built yet, you won't have an operator necessarily, but an operator that's on similar, um, that's worked on similar facilities in your company would, would be great insight, and preferably one or two of them. Um, experienced operators. Someone from the laboratory and the chemistry and the analytical side of the company that knows of the chemical reactions, the catalysts, so they've got an in-depth knowledge of the chemistry and the reaction mechanisms taking place. That's usually not a chemical engineer. Okay, usually it's someone else from a more chemistry-oriented background has some very deep knowledge on the different side reactions that could occur the chemistry, the, cat the catalysis that's occurring here. Someone with that sort of background is, is really critical. Engineers, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical, those are three types of engineers that are, are critical. So you usually will have those three in a company role. Okay. So it's a big group that's pulled together and, and you're going to see the reason for why that is. Every one of them is going to bring their background and their ex expertise here. So what you'll do is you'll work through that flow sheet, as we said, from, from feed point to exit point, and you follow that flow sheet and you, you focus on every node. Now a node is very specific. A node here in this example would be the portion leaving the pump after the split. Okay, so this piece of pipe after the split leaving the pump. That's that fairly detailed. Okay. What you're going to do is you're going to consider 
the process variables on that node, we're going to call those parameters. So you're going to consider flow rates, the temperature, level, pressure, composition, <coughs> operator actions that could occur on that node, corrosion that might occur on that node. Now some of them won't make sense uh, in, every, in every instance, right? So if it's just a piece of pipe, there's no operator action that can take place. Okay, so then that parameter will be out of consideration. But there's flow, temperature, level, level as well in the pipe won't make sense. So again, that parameter will be omitted. Pressure, absolutely composition. Okay, so now we've got a node, and then we've got multiple parameters. So the work we're gonna do next we're going to do for that node on every parameter. So we're going to come back, look at the flow, come back, look at the temperature, look at the level. This is why you end up spending eight hours on this. Okay. Then what you're going to do is, for every parameter that you selected, let's say we're considering that node, we're now going to work with flow. We're going to say, what's going to happen when we deviate from normal operation? So we have some sort of required or designed flow rate for that pipe. Let's say five meters cubed per hour. What's going to happen when that flow deviates, when that flow is low, when the flow is high, when there's no flow? Okay. So deviations from normal operating point. And we actually have um, some guide words that we'll use. So I'll, I'll show you what some of those are. But the first one we're going to look at here is less. Okay, so less means less than normal. So it doesn't mean zero flow. It just simply says instead of, well, let's take this specific example. Instead of 4.1 meters cubed per second of ammonia at 20 degrees Celsius, pressure of 3.5 atmosphere, from the pump after the split, and this is leading to a heat exchange. So there's a heat exchanger after this. We're considering that piece of pipe between the pump and the heat exchanger. So what's going to happen if there's less than normal, less than normal is my deviation flow in that pipe? Well, before we get to let's see what's going to happen, let's first see what might cause that deviation. Once we've got the cause, then we can go look at the consequences. So what might cause less than normal flow in that pipe leading to the heat exchanger? A leak? Okay, so take a minute or two and write down two or three causes that you could think of. And if, you, if, you, if you're even further ahead, write down what the consequence of that's going to be. Take two, three minutes to think through that. Okay, so what could cause no flow, uh, low, low flow to the pump? <coughs> uh, sorry, from the pump to the heat exchanger, I should say. Low, low flow, lower than normal. So 
small delta P. Small delta P. Okay, is that? See, the, in the, in the pressure P really fine. Okay, so there's, we're considering this one. Cause, what can cause low flow? A delta P, a low delta P, where is the, is that the cause? The, the pump isn't operating well. The pump isn't operating well, okay. I was saying like pump failure. Pump failure, okay, is that going to be low flow or no flow? Like half failure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Low flow, anything else? Yeah, Maybe the pipe is A blockage in the pipe somewhere? Yeah. Malfunctioning splitter. A malfunctioning splitter. Okay, so something may be clogged in there as well. Or if that would that cause low flow or high flow, it depends where the clog is, right? Yeah. Okay, so we also don't have the instrumentation up on this on along this pipe to the heat exchanger, but maybe there's some way that the, that the there's a back pressure set up in the heat exchanger, so someone's gone and mostly close the valve on the heat exchanger. So throttling the flow in that pipe. Okay. So if there's low flow, and this is going to heat exchanger, we have to then consider what are the consequences of this. Okay. So some of the consequences might be that we now have low flow coming into our heat exchanger. That material is going to heat up and accept the heat from the heat exchanger <laughs> to heat it up beyond what it should have been. So we've got a much lower flow rate, longer residence time in the heat exchanger, more heat uptake. So that may cause a situation where that ammonia is start to bubble in the liquid phase. Right? So we, that can then lead to a potential damage in the equipment. We don't, uh, so this is where you need, you can see now why, I don't even know the answer to this. Right? Why is what, what could be the consequence? So here we need someone who's got expertise on knowing what's going to happen with ammonia when it gets heated up to a certain point. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. I can certainly go figure it out and do some calculations. But it's going to be a potential issue if that ammonia heats up to, let's say, uh, 40, 50, 60 degrees Celsius. There could be a significant consequence to that okay. under low flow conditions. So then we need to start proposing some ideas to mitigate this problem. What might be some ways we can? <coughs> So if we, let's say we've worked through the consequence and the, that this consequence can be fairly serious, leading to damage of the equipment or people, what might be some actions we could take on, there, on this unit? Yeah, it's preventative maintenance on the pump to ensure that it's always operating well. Yeah, so that would prevent these half failures from occurring. A lot to look between the <coughs> chicken fluoride and then with the heat exchanger, turn it on and off from the streams, downstream of the heat exchanger. Okay, so check the flow rate. That's one thing, absolutely. So the flow rate can tell us if there's low flow. And then we have to make a choice of where to manipulate something if that flow is too low. What can we manipulate? The flow of the downstream. Manipulate the flow of the hot stream. Okay. We could also manipulate something upstream from here. So that now we have some choices to consider and evaluate. So th this is exactly the purpose of a hazard operability study, is to simply identify these causes and <coughs> notice here we're not proposing a fix right away. There's no way we can do that in this eight-hour meeting. Okay? because we've got all these other nodes and parameters to consider. So all we do is we simply brainstorm some ideas for correction. So if some, someone simply says at the end of the meeting, okay, Salah is going to go and report back next week on, ten, on two or three alternatives to avoid low flow. Okay, and then there's a, there's a follow-up meeting to evaluate what those alternatives are. Okay, so this is what, what we spend our time doing in Hazard. So simply brainstorming ideas to correct these problems, or create it if you're often, well this is done before the process has been designed, how can we design our process better to prevent a problem from occurring? So remember right at the start of the section I'd said, like, if you go to Ikea and you buy their furniture, by and large, most of their furniture is set up so that you, when you assemble it, you're not going to screw it up, assemble it. 
okay? So it's always the pegs are asymmetrical. If you look at it next time, the pegs are always put on asymmetrically so that your possibility of assembling it wrong is very, very low. So they intrinsically designed the process to prevent people from making a mistake. We'd like to do the same thing as engineers. Can we design our process? Because this hazard is done prior to building. We've still got time to catch this. We haven't bought any of our equipment yet. Can we add some extra piping? Can we add some extra instrumentation, alarm systems, valves, motors, and so on, pumps, to prevent situations from occurring that might have otherwise? Okay, so. This is why it hasn't taken a long time, because you've got to be really creative thinking about what deviations and the cause and effect. This is why our knowledge as engineers is so useful in the hazard, because we're probably one of the few people in the room that can actually relate cause and consequence okay, from our reactor design, our transfer courses, and so on. Okay, so let's take a look at some other guide words. So let, maybe just recap it. We can start to see why this is so combinatorial. We've got one node that we're considering. Now we've got multiple parameters. Okay. And for this parameter, this called P1, P2, parameter 3, for each parameter we're going to consider all these guidelines. So we're going to consider no, low, I. So no flow, no high flow, low flow. We're going to consider reverse flow. What if that, how, what, is there a way possibly that we can get reverse flow occurring right here? Okay. So the deviation is, or the guide word is reverse, reverse flow cause. Is there any possible way that reverse flow could occur? And if so, then we look at the consequence of the action. So it's not to say that many times hazards will just end right here because it's not possible for something to occur. But let's say reverse flow is possible and the consequences are going to be, be, uh, be damaging because if reverse flow occurs, it might go into this stream, sorry, it goes back through the pump and upstream and there could be a, a catastrophic consequence. So what is what might be an action taken there for reverse flow? Check valve. The check valve, the one-way valve. Okay, so many of the flow sheets you see have several one-way valves, and that's because they have been identified. We, know, we don't go put one-way valves anywhere and everywhere, right? If, if that was the case, every pipe would come with built-in one-way valves. Right? We don't do that. They cost, they cost a lot of money, and there's maintenance required for them. So wherever you see one-way valves in the flow sheet is because someone's gone through and done a hazard and a probability study and recognized the need for a one-way valve. Okay, so so there's, there's an example of reverse flow. Um, and you can start to see over here some of these words don't make sense for flow. So flow, we typically will look at no flow, more flow, less flow, reverse flow. We won't look at sooner or later than because that doesn't make sense for flow. So for that parameter, certain of the guide words are not relevant. Then we'll move on to parameter two, parameter three, and for each of these, we'll go consider guide word one, guide word two, guide word three, guide word four, and so on. This is why hazards take a long time. So every one of these, we have to go look at cause, consequence, and then any actions to take. By the end of this, four or five hour meeting, you've assembled a pretty large spreadsheet um, in a table form. So we're going to take a look at what those tables look like um, in a case study next, next class. Um, I'll just point out to you. So typically what's done in companies is they'll set up a spreadsheet where they write their guide word down in the first column. And then the, the sheet on the, in the, or the tab in the spreadsheet will be for a node. So here my node is the feed pipe and the parameter I'm considering is flow. So I'll have a, a sheet here for flow, and I'll consider no flow is my guide word. The deviation is no feed flow, cause, consequence, and then action will be. So this, uh, 
Unfortunately, this slide is split up over two. So this is the, the top half of the spreadsheet, and this is the bottom half of the spreadsheet continues on with those columns. So you'll, you'll simply create new rows for every possibility over here. Okay, so for every one of these pauses, so the feed pump stops, or the feed valve is closed, the flow, mate, flow meter indicates a false high flow. For each one of those, you will then identify the consequence and then a corrective action that needs to be suggested. And in some cases here, for this consequence and for this cause, there's two potential corrective actions. So that you build up a spreadsheet for every one of these. Okay. Is that, that process clear? That, just that, that mechanism that companies will follow. So we'll take a look at some examples next next class. I don't want to start this case study because as you'll run out of time for the last two, three minutes that are left here. Um, so let's take a look at that next time. And any questions before we, we wrap up there?